morning, church. Good morning. Uh, so good to be here with you today. Uh, we've had a stellar week at uh, VBS this week. Uh, pardon the pun. But yes, yeah, so grateful. Uh, Dave already gave thanks to all of those that uh, were involved in the uh, preparation and planning of this week. But uh, always a fun week. We know, we know it's a successful VBS when the staff still have enough energy to stand, but... but, uh, but uh, are ready to sit down. Uh, we, we know we've had a good week and a, and a good time with uh, all of you um, and, and uh, ministering, celebrating the light of Jesus with your children. And so we're so glad to have everybody together for this this week. I'd like to start out by telling you a little bit of a story here. I, I grew up in northern Wyoming, and Utah is known for its dark places and so is my home state of Wyoming, which, of course, borders this state. Uh, there's something about having some of those wide open spaces and very clear, dry air and uh, a low population of people like we have in certain parts of Utah that uh, make for skies that are just incredible and for, for dark places that, that uh, are illuminated and, and beautiful. And so... It is uh, something that was part of my experience growing up and part of, part of our um, collective experience here in Utah as well, is looking at the night sky, experiencing all the beauty of the Milky Way and the galaxies that, that uh, are part of, our, part of our world. And one of the things that, that I grew up with was a lot of camping, backpacking in the mountains, being at at high elevations, which, which gives you even more clarity when it comes to looking into the night sky because you're just looking through less atmosphere, less dust, less moisture, uh, less air, and uh, able to see the details of the night sky. And, and I think you all can probably relate to this. Uh, most people in Utah have a sense of this, but I, I have been with, with groups of students for outdoor survival programs that I did in Montana for almost 20 years. And, and a lot of times we would have students from other parts of the world or from large cities that would get out there in the dark one night on our survival outing and they would look up at the sky and they would just be shocked. You know, sometimes they look up in the sky and just go, ah, what's, what is that? I've actually been with people where for the very first time they saw the Milky Way and they were terrified because they thought that certainly some intergalactic spaceship was descending upon the planet and they couldn't figure out what these stripes were in the sky. The Milky Way. Milky Way. Again, for some of us, these are things that are commonplace. They're ordinary. We're, we're used to it. We've experienced it our whole lives. And, and for me... A lot of those conversations took place either with my father or with my grandfather out on a camping trip or at my grandfather's cabin in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming looking up at that night sky and asking questions. Sometimes it would begin with an observation like this, look at those stars, to which my grandfather might reply, not all of those are stars. Well, what else are they, Grandpa? Well, some of those lights are stars, but some of those lights are planets, and some of those lights are galaxies. Like the galaxy that we're looking at right now, my grandpa would say. And I would say, well, what? I don't see a galaxy. And he said, see that big white stripe going through the sky? That's part of our own Milky Way galaxy. That's a long arm of our galaxy that's going off out into space, uh, light years away, millions of light years away. And that's part of our galaxy that we can see because we're kind of looking at it on edge. And, and he would often pick something up like, like you know, maybe a, a Frisbee that we had been using that day and, and, and pick that up and show it to me on edge and see this is how it would look if you were looking at part of the edge of it. And it would help me imagine what I was seeing and, and what was going on there. Some of those lights or other galaxies, little tiny galaxies off in the distance that are actually not tiny. They're incredibly huge. And yet they emit a light that when you see it with your naked eye, you say, look at all those stars. And maybe we should be saying, look at all those galaxies. Or look at those planets. And my grandfather would also show me that 
that planets tend to be in a certain kind of place. They, they tend to kind of follow a line in the sky because they're all part of a solar system that we're a part of, and they all tend to kind of uh, hang out and orbit in, in, the, in a similar pathway. Similar to the pathway of the sun, actually, when we see the sun arising in the east and setting in the west, these planets are also kind of moving in that same kind of direction, that same kind of place. And that's part of how you can find them, and it's part of how you can know that they're planets instead of stars. Some of the lights that we see out there in that sky, my grandfather would tell me, some of those lights are comets. Uh, during my childhood, one of the things that we began to see was Halley's Comet. This comet that just showed up in our night sky, this, this little streak, this little stripe, it wasn't shaped like the other stars. So many things out there. And I remember asking a question. The question was this, Grandpa, what's the difference? How do you tell the difference between a planet and a star? And Grandpa would explain that part of it is the location, but he also explained to me that, that stars and planets are different in this sense, that that stars generate their own light, but planets reflect the light from another star. And that a planet, like our moon, for example, it doesn't have any light of its own. It only shines off of its surface the light that, that comes from a source. And Grandpa would do something like this. He'd pick up a rock. My grandpa, Clayton Curtis, was, was somebody who would pick up a rock that had a lot of... Uh, that was rough, it, it looked like it would have craters on it. You know, a piece of volcanic rock out of the riverbed that was nice and round and had a really rough texture to it. And he'd hold it up and then he'd take his flashlight and shine his flashlight on that rock. And he'd say, see there how that light's shining off of that rock? And if you go over here, it's like a half moon. And if you go over here, it's a full moon. And he would demonstrate those kinds of things to me to try to help me, you know, kind of envision and imagine what's going on when I'm looking at that full moon. It means that the sun is like a big flashlight that's somewhere behind our earth shining on that moon and lighting it up in the night sky. We would go through all kinds of demonstrations of how, you know, the moon would be very small and then it would be, get bigger and bigger and bigger as, as, as things changed in, in its orbit around the earth. This angle of the sun was different. Explaining those kinds of things. And one of the things that uh, Grandpa also explained to me that I remember hearing it for the first time and being kind of shocked. He said, you know, the sun is a source of light the sun is, is a thermonuclear reactor. There's a fusion reaction going on in the sun that is generating incredible amounts of energy and light that shines down upon our earth. And it's all this science that's going on in this thing. And then he would say something like this. Our moon is illuminated by a star that we call the sun. And I can remember thinking, wait a minute, no, the sun isn't a star. A sun is a sun. And my grandpa would say, yes, but stars, real stars out in outer space, are actually distant suns. Our sun just happens to be really close, so it's really bright. And, and we experience this, this brightness of our sun because it's so close. But there are other suns out there, other stars out there. The sun is a star. Wow. I said, yeah, that, grandpa, that's amazing. The, the sun is a star. We looked back again at the night sky, and as we looked at that night sky, I said to my grandpa, I said, well, how can you tell, of all those lights out there in the sky, how can you tell which ones are planets, and which ones are comets, and which ones are galaxies, and especially, how can you tell which ones are stars? And my grandpa said this to me, he said, you can tell that they're stars, any guesses? You can tell that they're stars because they twinkle. That's how you can tell that they're stars. Well, that's pretty easy for a kid, right? Because I know a song about that. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Don't worry, Clay. It's not nap time. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> startled my grandson for a second there because that's the song we sing right before, you know, and so it kind of freaks him out a little bit when you say those words and it's not the right time. Yeah. But stars twinkle. 
That's what they do. That's how you know that they're stars. And of course, that leads to all kinds of other questions like, well, Grandpa, why do stars twinkle and planets don't twinkle? What's up with that? How, how does that work? My grandpa was an optometrist as well as a, a teacher at heart. And so you ask a grandpa optometrist a question like that, and now you don't have the rock and the flashlight. Now you go into a whole other description of refraction and reflection and how light travels through space and how light is affected by other things like, for example, our atmosphere. And one of the things that my grandpa always loved was he loved mirage. And when, when you live in Wyoming, you see a lot of mirage. You, you see this, the heat waves coming off of the desert floor, and you look off into a distance, and you think there's a lake, and you drive your Jeep, drive, 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 we're going to go to the lake, and pretty soon you notice the lake just disappeared. It wasn't even real. It wasn't even there. What was that? It was mirage. It was heat, light shining on surface, generating heat, and all these different games that are played as, as, as the atmosphere and the air and the, the sunlight, refraction and reflection start to do their thing. And my, my grandpa began to describe to me and explain to me that, that when, you, when a star is out there, a stars are really, really far away. And they're huge, but they're so far away that, that the light source of them is a very intense light source, but it's also a very, very tiny light source because it's so far away. It's just this little pinhole of light that's shining through. Whereas planets, planets are closer to our earth and because they're closer to our earth, they actually end up being kind of a little bit larger dot of light. They're not this little tiny pin. They're, they're a little bit larger and it's those little tiny pins of light, those little, those distant stars that when they hit our atmosphere, they're affected more by the refraction and reflection of our atmosphere so that, so that when they shine through, if there's any distortion that is created by our, our Earth's atmosphere, it distorts those little tiny pins of light more than it, it, it distorts the larger ones like the planets. And so when that little tiny bit of light comes through, it gets distorted by, by turbulence in our atmosphere, and when it gets distorted, it twinkles. It gets brighter, it gets dimmer, it changes colors sometimes. It might, it might go from one color to another. And, and of course, Grandpa would be very careful to point out, you know, Grandpa, is that a star? It's twinkling. No, that's an airplane. <laughs> is that a star? It's not twinkling. That's, that's actually a satellite, Barry. It's a satellite. But we would have those kinds of conversations and look at those kinds of things. And one of the things that Grandpa would demonstrate to me is you know, sometimes we were sitting by a stream or by a lake and he would say, you notice how the moonlight shimmers off of that lake? That's kind of like what the starlight is doing, but it's, but it's shimmering off of our atmosphere as it comes through. And, and it twinkles, doesn't it? It twinkles. And most of the time, the only response I could give to some of the answers that Grandpa would give me was, Wow. Sometimes I'd say it backwards, wow. Sometimes I thought about saying it backwards and upside down, mom. Okay, you've all fallen asleep now. I'm worried about you guys. All right, well, I tried. Sometimes that's the best you can do. All right, James says, James 1, verses 16 through 17, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down. From the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. When I read this verse, it reminds me of that lesson about twinkling stars. Only this verse doesn't just talk about the lights in the sky. It talks about, it takes us beyond the stars. It takes us millions or billions of light years away. Beyond the stars to a Father of lights. A lot of times when we talk about stars, my grandpa was explaining the moon and you know, planets and stars to me, you know, that planets just reflect light that hits them, but stars are a source of light. This verse takes us even further, and my grandpa would always be quick to remind me that, that even though the star may be a source of light, there's a one who is the source of the stars, this father of lights, and that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down 
from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation, no twinkle, twinkle, little star, for this Father of lights. He doesn't vary. He's not affected by a change in atmosphere or shadow. It doesn't become brighter or dimmer. It doesn't change. And yet the interesting thing for us in our lives and in our experience is that, that we might read a verse like that and say, well, wait a minute, I think I've seen variation in God. I think I've seen times where He's closer to me and He feels more loving and caring. And then there's other times where He doesn't feel close or He doesn't feel loving or He doesn't feel caring. He feels distant. He feels far. It feels like there is some kind of var- variation. I felt a shadow. I felt change. And when we feel that, The question I wonder is, do we feel shadow and do we feel change because God has changed? Or is it our atmosphere? (laughs) Is it our atmosphere that that is causing a twinkle in a God who is steady and faithful and strong and always there? Always there. I love how James continues. He says, of his own he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He brought us forth from His own Word. And He brought us forth to be a first fruits of His creatures. That that somehow in the process of the redemption of humanity, God is taking people and He's bringing them forth and and placing them in a place that, that they never were on to begin with. A center stage. A most important central part of His creation. You know, as human beings, we, we recognize something about ourselves, and that something about ourselves is we're, although we aspire to be stars, we, we aspire to have some kind of status in the world, to, to shine, to be a source of our own light. In reality, we are planets, and we function not as stars, but more like planets. Notice what John says about John the baptizer. He says, there was a man sent from God, whose name was John. And he came as a witness, to bear witness about the light. That's what planets do. (laughs) Planets witness about the light. If you see a full moon, it's witnessing that there is a sun. And he came to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. When you see a full moon, you believe that the sun exists, even if you can't see it. He came to bear witness about the light. He he came to shine, not his own light, but he came to shine the light of another. You could translate this verse instead of saying there was a man sent from God. You could say this, there there was a moon sent from God. That's what we are. We're ones that receive something that shines upon us and we reflect it and we share it out to the rest of the world. There was a moon sent from God whose name was John. And then John goes on to say this. I love this. John knows the stars. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. This this uses language that our English language doesn't actually express very well. When you read this in Greek, and you know Greek well, if you read this in Greek, knowing Greek well, you discover this, this progressive, present, continuous developing, expanding, growing kind of language that says the true light which gives light to everyone was was emerging, was moving in upon the scene, progressively, presently, continually, expanding, growing, moving. We have to throw so many different English words and adjectives into this to try to make any kind of sense. John's trying to capture this idea that a world that that didn't even know what light was suddenly had this experience where the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He goes on, he says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. Imagine that. 
Imagine coming to a creation that you made. You know it more intimately than it knows itself. And you come to your creation, and your creation doesn't recognize you. It doesn't know you. He came to his own. He came to the, his own creation, and his own people did not receive him. And then John goes on to explain, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Think about that. Moons get promoted to be children of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of man. Born of God. A whole new existence. I don't know if you've ever taken a chance to, to look at the moon. We've got a facsimile of it up here behind our satellite. Pockmarked with craters. You ever look at the moon and think to yourself, what kind of violence took place on that innocent little moon? And what did that innocent little moon ever deserve do to deserve getting pounded by meteors? Torn to shreds by bombardment of what? What is beating up on that poor planet? Well, the truth and the reality of every single one of us is that if you were to look at our hearts, not uh, literally, but emotionally, you could look at our hearts. Our hearts would look a lot like the moon. There's some big craters. You can think about your craters, right? What, what are your craters? Don't say it out loud. But each and every one of us, we have our craters, right? We have those times and places in our lives where something hit us really hard. Something hit us with a lot of impact and a lot of pain and a lot of violence and trouble. And you had that impact. You had that experience. And part of what this verse tells us is that there's an opportunity that every human being has to receive the Father of lights receive his son Jesus and to be restored from a planet that has been bombarded even as it has tried to reflect the rays of light that have been coming upon it. And a planet that can be healed, can be restored. It can be reborn. Not reborn in the same kind of way that it was born originally, but, but born by the will and the power of God. To be born again. In the very next verse, John shares this poetic phrase with us. And the Word, logic itself, reason itself, the logos in Greek, the logic of God, the thought of God, the idea of God, became flesh. The way he found to rescue us was to take himself and wrap himself in a human body and to dwell among us to live among us, to exist in our reality, in our atmosphere, in our place and in our world. And we have seen His glory. (laughs) We've never seen anything like it, but we've seen His glory. He came and He appeared to us. And we've seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, it's hard for us to even recognize this, but 2,000 years ago, there were people that were willing to die for this fact. And they were willing to die for this fact because they had actually seen and experienced and realized the incarnate glory of God in the person of the man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They experienced it. They walked with him. They talked with him. They watched him touch lepers and completely heal and restore them like a moon full of craters suddenly restored to this pristine, perfect world. Blind men receiving their sight. People unable to walk. Dead people raised to life. And they saw it all. They experienced it all. They were eyewitnesses of it. And then they saw the unimaginable. The one that had conquered life, it seemed. The one that conquered death, it seemed. The one who could restore and heal and save everyone suddenly wasn't apparently either able or willing to save himself. Captured by the Romans, nailed to a cross, tortured until he died. 
And imagine the cognitive dissonance you would have if you had been walking and talking with one so powerful he could raise the dead one minute and then find him dead the next. Talk about disillusionment, right? Sometimes they're kind of hard on Peter for denying, but, but I think you've got to reach a certain point where it's like, okay, I guess uh, the power has left. <laughs> Whatever this guy was, he's not that anymore, or maybe he never was. And then, on the third day, they see him risen from the dead. They see nail marks in his hands and in his feet and in his, at a, at a, the mark of a spear in his side. And they can't deny that either. They can't deny that he was dead. And they can't deny that he's now alive and he's risen. And he's walking and talking among them in the world. But now as he's walking and talking among them in the world, there's something different about this Jesus. Yeah, he's still got a body. He, he, he eats fish and demonstrates, see, I'm, I'm, I'm really a physical being. I have a body. But his body can do things his body couldn't do before. He can appear in a room with locked doors. He can vanish invisibly, disappear before their eyes the very next minute. He has a glorified body. He has a resurrected body. His body is different. The mortal has put on immortality. The corruptible has put on incorruption. Something new. And there's something different about this Jesus. And I think it's with that Jesus in mind that James originally wrote to us today and and said, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above. When James says this, I think he's recognizing there's, there's one good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. How can James testify to that? James can testify to that because he's actually experienced the good and the perfect gift that has come down from the Father of lights. And he sees something in that one. This Word of God become flesh. This glory of God that has come down to be among us. And he says, this gift, there's no variation to it. There's no shadow due to change. This gift comes down to us from the Father of lights. And then James turns to his audience. And he he says, he is the source that shines upon us all. He is the one who we now reflect to the world. Of his own will, he brought us forth by this word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits. First fruits is an old Hebrew idea that says if you've experienced the power of God and you've experienced what, what God is doing in the world, what his goal is, what his plan is, you're kind of like the first crop that a farmer ever harvests. You ever think about the foolishness of har- of Farming. I mean, how how many of you have done a garden this year? I know some of you, you're you're ashamed to raise your hand, right? Because, yes, like I planted a garden, but it actually looks a whole lot more like weeds now. Well, join the club. I have a special club for people like that. It's called Weeders Anonymous. And I want to remain anonymous about my weeding practices this year. But Part of what seems to happen with or without us, to our credit or even in spite of us, is that a garden tends to produce some first fruit. I don't know about you, but the apricots that I got this year have worms in every single one of them. Okay, nice little white silver glistening chunks of protein in my vegan apricots. Yeah, what do you do? How do you, how do you do this organic? We were talking about that the other day. It's like, how, how do we do this right, you know? But, but it's first fruits. It's a gift. Kind of marred by our world, but it, it's a gift. Coming down from the Father of lights, his first fruits, his, his first crop that we harvest. And the, and the biblical notion of first fruits is that, that we are the first fruits of the garden that God planted when His Son was planted into the ground and then rose from the dead. That first crop. That first crop that is evidence that the Father is a good farmer and that His work actually works and that His world actually functions to His glory. 
And this call to be a first fruits, the first fruits of all his creatures, is a call to let your light shine, to be that moon. Notice it doesn't say make your light shine. It says let your light shine. Don't cover it up. Don't don't hide it under a bushel. Let it shine. And then he says this, but to all who did not receive him, sorry, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Not born of the blood, nor the will of flesh, of flesh nor the will of man, but born of God. So here we are. On a camping trip, the sun is going down, and the stars are coming out. Orion is off in the distance. You can see Orion's belt and Orion's sword right out there on the horizon. You turn to Grandpa. You say, Grandpa, what's the difference between planets and stars? Grandpa says, well, planets... Just shine. Stars twinkle. Grandpa, is it ever possible that a planet could twinkle too? A planet would have to become a star to twinkle. A planet would have to be changed somehow to twinkle. It it would have to have something else about it that makes it different. Kind of like Jesus. Jesus makes us different, transforms us, renews us, makes us shine in whole new ways. 